What's up guys? Welcome back to our third week in this series about anger. And so far we have talked about anger and how we can get rid of some of that anger by forgiving other people. And we talked about lowering the expectations that we hold other people to so that we can avoid miscommunication and the anger that spins off of those moments as well. We talked about some of the effects of anger on our lives. We learned that anger actually divides us, it distracts us, and can even discredit us in the eyes of other people. Those are all horrible things. And in small groups last week, you looked at a few ways to deal with that anger in constructive, in a constructive way. Now tonight, we're gonna look at a verse that we read the very first week and we're gonna unpack it further. Tonight's topic though is a hard one, right? It's really hard to put into practice and I'm gonna ask you guys to step it up this week. Now I know that's kind of ironic since we just talked about lowering expectations of other people, but guys, there are just times when we still have to hold each other accountable to those hard lines in life and tonight's discussion is one of those times. Tonight we're gonna to look at how our words come into play when we're angry and how they can either help or completely ruin a situation. A verse that we looked at earlier told us to not sin in our anger. Not that we can't be angry, we just can't let that anger lead us into sinful behaviors. Now our words are an area where we can fall into that trap pretty easily. We can say things that are hurtful and sinful when our emotions are right there on the surface. So in our time tonight, we are going to try and be better than that. So before we get to the passage, let me get a quick poll of everybody in the room tonight. So how many of you guys, you can put your hands up, have blurted out something in anger and then immediately wish you could have taken that all back? Most of us have at some point because we're thinking with our emotions and not our logic. Guys, we're going to get into that whole process in just a few minutes. But let's look at James 1 again to be reminded of how we're to react when we're angry. James 1.19 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When we get angry, there's a specific cycle that initiates inside our bodies. I, and some, I took some extra time this week to actually research all this, as it's pretty important to our understanding of anger and how we process it. When we're angry, there's a part of our brain inside called the amygdala that activates. I know big fancy words. I had to practice that like 30 times. This is the fight or flight part of our brain, right? It happens when we're scared or even when we get angry. And once this part of the brain is tripped, it releases certain hormones into our bodies that are related to stress. Hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. Adrenaline you're probably more familiar with. These are gonna circulate all over our body, causing all kinds of secondary systems to activate as well. And one of the impacts of these hormones in our body is that it changes our brain chemistry a little bit, right? Cortisol and adrenaline actually cause our prefrontal cortex, another part of our brain, to slow down its neural connections. And guess what that part of our brain controls? That's considered the logic center of our brain. Did you guys see the issue with that whole interaction that we just saw? When we're angry, the body reacts as if there's a threat and it releases stress hormones. And those stress hormones then shut down the logic, logic part of our brain. It's like we're already at a deficit when we start trying to process our anger, which absolutely makes sense as to why we do it so poorly all the time. So how do we avoid the mistake of speaking out of anger and saying things that we regret or that cause more trouble then they fix. Well, guys, we can get out of this cycle by teaching ourselves over time to be slow to respond when we're angry. This isn't our natural inclination at all. When we're angry, typically we are quick to respond with very emotional responses, but that isn't always the best response, the best answer. By slowing down our response to, um, internally, we're actually able to put into practice what James 1.19 was telling us all along. When we feel anger boiling up, one thing we can do is to try and ask questions to better understand the situation instead of just jumping to our own conclusions, right? Moving into detective mode early is gonna help us keep our emotions in check and not let them cloud our decision-making process. Also asking questions is gonna help us get a better understanding of where that other person is coming from that's causing us to be angry in the first place. So being an active listener, even when your emotions have you so worked up, is a great way to start controlling your anger and not letting it control you. Now, if that anger is coming up too fast, man, it is absolutely fine to take some time and cool off. You can even step away from the situation if you need to. Now, don't just go silent and walk away. It's kind of weird, kind of scary. That's not how mature people communicate it, right? But you can totally tell the person that you're mad at that, you know what? 
I'm feeling a lot of emotions right now, and I need to just take a few minutes to gather myself before we talk about this and try to work through this, right? This conversation, it lets them know what you're feeling and at the same time that you want to resolve this issue in a healthy way. It also shows that you are in control of your emotions and the response that they pull out of you. Um, We're going to have a cool little object lesson in our group time tonight, but let's look at verse in Ephesians 4 that gives some guidance on how we should use our words. Yes, even when we're angry. In Ephesians 4, 29, we hear Paul tell the church, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Guys, we are warned to let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths, right? That means not only rude and inappropriate things that are coming out, but also unkind things. When we're angry, it is so easy to get personal and say unkind things to hurt the other person um, that we're mad at. But that's not how a Christian is supposed to behave. We're to be the masters of our words and not let them rule over us. Think about social media and some of the mess that you guys have seen out there, right? Are people good at building each other up like Paul encourages us to? Sadly, no. People want to be right in their own eyes and then put that other person in their place more then they want to show grace. But guys, grace is exactly what we have been called to show. In fact, Paul gets to that just a few lines later in this letter that he wrote to Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Right? There's a clear connection between understanding how much we have been forgiven and how we choose our words towards other people, especially those that we're mad at. We're to be kind and forgiving of other shortcomings because God has already forgiven each of us so much stuff that we messed up in our own lives, right? He doesn't treat us as we deserve, and we need to be sure that we don't accept that grace and then refuse to offer it to other people when they make us angry or wrong us. That's being hypocritical. So let's look at two more passages before we finish up our time tonight. And they both tie into this anger in our words things. Proverbs 15, 4 says, A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. The word that we have translated gentle can actually mean healing as well in the original language. We have the power to heal in our words and bring out good things, or we have the power to break the spirit of other people. Now, you guys know exactly what this looks like, right? You've, you've got it in a mental picture. A friend is angry about something. They say something hurtful to another friend, and you can see it in that other friend's body language, like immediately, right? Their spirit was just crushed. It could be that their shoulders kind of drop down. They start looking at the floor. Their eyes look away. You know that those words stung, and it's heartbreaking. And we need to be certain that we are never the ones causing that kind of hurt to another person. As a follower of Jesus, our words should be life-giving, not spirit-breaking. Another great verse about our words is just a few lines later in Proverbs 16, 24, where we read this. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Now, kind words are gonna be like a treat, like honey to our spirits. You can put in whatever candy you want there. Kind words will help our emotional health and even spill over into our physical health as well. So when we're angry, because we're going to be angry, right, we need to be sure that our words are life-giving, not spirit-crushing. We need to listen to understand and take a step back if that gives us the time we need to calm down. We shouldn't be known as people that are speaking harshly in anger all the time. That's not the model that Jesus gave us or the commands that we find in Scripture. Guys, I think in just a few verses we have looked at today, it is abundantly clear there is a lot more power in our words than we realize, and when we need to be careful when we're angry, that we don't use our words to hurt other people. We're gonna continue this conversation now in small groups, um, and hope you guys have some good conversations there and, and get some good examples of things that you can put into practice, some application, right, out of that time tonight, and we will see you all real soon.